Hacking Cast gives us a chance to bring in people from across the industry to come and present and speak and talk to us, like Josh's today. And we're, I'm a big fan of Josh, right? I got a chance to see that so I was early in my SANS career and they did these SANS at night talks and they were like, Jason, you should go check out some because you work here. You should see what the other instructors are like. And I went and sat in Josh's and Josh, you gave the presentation on how you hacked Candy Crush. And I just sat there in awe of your presentation skills and your hacking skills. And I was like, it's good. It's good stuff. <laughs> So for the 59 people that are here right now, can you give me like a really, just give us a real brief synopsis of what you did and some of the technology behind it? Because it was ridiculous how you broke Candy Crush down into its elements. Like you, you were talking about mobile apps, like hacking. Yeah. Stuff, but so my anniversary was coming up and I had no gift and I had to figure out something quick. And, you know, I'm I'm not going to say that it, you know Amazon Prime two day wasn't going to make it, but Amazon Prime two day wasn't going to make it like kind of a thing. So I noticed that my wife, when she plays Candy Crush, she changes the date ahead on her iPad. I asked her why, and uh, she said, "Oh, you run out of lives, and so if you set the date ahead, you get five more lives." And then I just change it back, and I, I let it catch up overnight. And I said, "And this is why I love you. Like this is fantastic, right? This nice. is amazing." Awesome. Um, so that night I went and looked at how Candy Crush actually saves its data. And in this game, you can do all these in-app purchases for different candies, all these different levels and things like that. And so what I did was I made a, a small purchase and then I took the data file from the iPad for that application and I saved it. And then I lost a life in Candy Crush. And then I took that new data file. I compared the data files with a binary editor, and sure enough, what was once you know 15 was now 14. And I, and I did a little more testing and went back and forth a bunch of times on that. And, and I figured out that I was able to get 65,535 lives on this game. And you know I wanted more, but the, the king.com developers that make Candy Crush, they only used a 16-bit unsigned integer for the number of lives. So you know, like you, sometimes you have limits, but I was able to get like all of these candies, all of the levels. I was able to get all these different shapes and, and everything, you know, actual retail value of all the things I added was like $42 million or something like that. <laughs> like it was, you know, it was huge. And so I, I gave it to her the next morning and uh, uh, she, she looked at it and she kind of looked at me, she looked at it. She looked at me and she said, you cheap bastard, right? It didn't, it didn't really go over that well. You know, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't a good time, you know, frankly. Um, she actually, for that same anniversary, I got a new guitar. And so that like, kind of kind of shows you the disparity of, of mm. like what, what was going on there. So it didn't, uh, it didn't, it didn't work out very well for me. <laughs> was, was it a $40 million guitar though? I mean, it was not, it was not, I mean, you know, so I mean, by that perspective, so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's fantastic. I was actually at that presentation you were at, Jason. Mm -hmm. I had a student come up to me later and he said, hi, I'm, I'm so-and-so. And I think he was, he might've been Swedish. And he said, uh, I work for uh, king.com. And, <laughs> and at the time I didn't, I didn't quite put together. I'm like, oh, nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. And he's like waiting for reaction. I didn't give it to him. And so he's like, you know, we, we make Candy Crush. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I mean, you kind of know, like, eventually that's going to happen, right? You can only criticize Microsoft so many times before somebody from Microsoft is in your classes, and then you, yeah. you know, kind of feel a little guilty about it, but not, not too guilty. He actually thanked me. He said, you know, this is exactly the motivation that I needed to bring to our internal security team to talk about why we need stronger defenses on the platform, things like that. And I'm mm -hmm. like, well, that's, that was my goal. Like, that's, that's what I wanted. <laughs> but, you know, whatever, that's, that's fantastic. Started. All right, everybody, thanks for being here today for this Wild West Hacking Cast on Develop Technical Recall Skills Based Repetition with Anki. How do you, how do you pronounce it, Josh? Anki. Okay. Uh, we have Josh right here. He's an uh, a instructor with the SANS Institute. He's like a senior instructor. He's an amazing presenter. I've gotten a chance to see that. I, I don't know if Josh would call him. So I don't know. Like, I, I don't think I'd ever call myself an amazing presenter, but it's nice when someone says it about me. So Josh is an amazing presenter. 
Uh, it's one of my favorites, and I'm just really thankful for him to be here. Also, he's an incredible photographer. If you ever get a chance to go to, is it Instagram where you keep all your stuff? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Uh, so Josh is on Instagram. And then, uh, BB, if you go ahead and turn off your camera and uh, your microphone, and we'll see you in a little bit. And then everybody else, if you have questions at any time, feel free to ask them in either go to webinar or in uh, Discord. We are using the Wild West Hacking Fest Discord today. Uh, so if you don't have an invite for that, I will post it right now in the chat. If you're watching the recording, you can take a look at that right beneath you there on YouTube, and you can find a link to it, and you can uh, join us on future Wild West Hacking Cast. Uh, but today we have Josh Wright. Once again, he's from the Sands Institute. He worked for a company called CounterHack. And he helps develop something amazingly called the Holiday Hack Challenge. And now I'm going to turn it over to Josh. Thanks for being here. Right. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, everybody, for joining here today, too. Glad to be here and glad to uh, have the chance to talk to everybody. So, you know, lately I've been trying to change up the kind of things that I'm talking about. If you've seen me present before, I typically find a technology. I analyze it until I figure out how to break it. I talk about how I break it, I release some half-baked tool that I'll never maintain again, and then, and then that's it, and then I move on to the next thing. But what I've discovered is that I struggle with a lot of things. You know, I, I struggle with technology, I struggle with trying to stay on, on topic, I, I struggle, struggle with you know, all the things that I'm expected to know and to remember and to learn and how technology changes and the things my customers are asking for. And what I found out was I'm not the only one. And so I wanted to figure out how I could do better. How can I do better at remembering things? How can I get better at uh, learning technology, trying to keep on top of things, optimizing my time, staying motivated? And so I, I started doing some research and it turns out that I could get better, and, and I have been getting better a little bit at a time, but I was so motivated by that but that I wanted to share it with everybody else. And so thanks to uh, Black Hills and Wild West Hacking Fest for helping me host this session. So this is me right here. This is my workspace that you can kind of see behind me with my monitors, right? And I, I just wanted to tell you about like how my morning goes, right? So this is what my morning looks like, okay? So uh, first thing in the morning, I think, uh, oh, geez, I need to learn about Docker Swarm. and Hey, this article on Portainer looks good, and Kubernetes, and Terraform, and Helm, and Spinnaker, you know, and should I memorize the arguments to Kube control, and what does EKS stand for again? Google that for a little while. Oh, crap, I messed up the GitHub repo again. Oh, I need to really spend some more time reading up on Docker Compose. Oh, and YAML. Oh, and what is this, and AKV, and AKS, and Vigor, and Ansible, and I have to Google all that, and maybe I should learn Rust, or Golang, or PowerShell, or Python 3, or Clojure. Honestly, that's the first uh, hour of my day. Okay? Like every single day, that's what happens to me. And, and I'm so overwhelmed by that all of the time. About all the things that we're expected to learn and, and expected to know and, and, and what's going on, things falling in my house and, and, and things like that. And, and it turns out that you know, I'm, I'm not the only one that struggles with this. And, and while that is satisfying to know that I'm not the only one that's struggling with it, I thought, you know, there's, there's going to be some better ways, and, and I wanted to try to find out what that is. You know, I do this often, and so I'll be working during the day, and, I, and I'll be doing something at the command line or in Microsoft Word or, or whatever, and uh, I'll be like, oh, how do I suppress a new line in awk? And then I'll, you know, try to Google that, and I'll, and I'll try to research that, you know, and, and I'll find, you know, oh, here's how you suppress something in awk. You use printf instead of print, and then you don't get the new line attached to the end of the line. Oh, great. Now, I solved my problem, but here's, here's the issue, okay? I will not remember this. In 15 minutes, this will be gone, and, and I'm going to have to look it up again. And that is so frustrating to me. It's, it's so difficult, and, you know, I'll know that I already Googled it. I see the purple hyperlink. I clicked on that before. And yet, I, I need to Google it again. I need to try to figure this out again. This happens all the time. Not once a day, not twice a day, but 10, 15 times a day. And I just forget because I'm just cutting and pasting from Stack Overflow with no recall. And, and really, I'm just not developing that as a long-term memorized skill. Now, before we start talking about the rest of this presentation and, and what I found for some solutions, I think it's important for you 
personally to answer this question. I'm not asking you to answer this on, on Discord. If you want to, you, you certainly can. But so here's a question to be able to answer for yourself. What are your goals for developing a technical skill? Now, maybe your goal is to get certified. You want to use that as a, a proof that you've done something and that you've accomplished something, and, and that's great. Maybe you want to build long-term recall so that you can remember something to draw on it later. Maybe you want to build your skills to advance in other more advanced areas. Maybe you want to be the subject matter expert that other people go to when they need assistance, right? The, the person that I call when, when I need help with this thing, that, that kind of person, you know? Maybe you want to use what you've learned to apply to your career goals, what, what you want to do in your own career, okay? Or maybe you want to run screaming from this career choice, this field, and do something different, you know? I, you know, I, I hear sales engineers make good money. Like, I, I don't know, but sometimes, you know, I think this is not for me. The bottom line is there's no wrong answer. It's a personal decision that you should know in advance. The things that I'm going to be talking about are not easy. They, they require time, they require energy, they require motivation and, and dedication, and they can be difficult. And so you should try to answer this question for yourself. What are your goals for developing this skill? And that will help you get through some of the more difficult areas that I'm going to talk about now. Now, I'm going to be critical on SANS for a second, and, and not just SANS, but any other training organization that does kind of compressed training. Now, I am a SANS author and, and senior instructor. I've been teaching for SANS for 17 years. I love the opportunity. I love the students I meet. SANS is, is a great place to work, and, you know, it's one of the best career decisions I made to go work for SANS. And as an author, when I write material, I use a analogy, I use illustrations, I use storytelling, I use hands-on exercises, I use all the things that I know will adapt to people of different learning styles and trying to make it available to everybody. And my goal is that when people take a class that's with me or somebody else teaching one of my classes, that they leave and they can immediately apply what they learned when they get back to the office. Here's, here's the problem, though. A six-day schedule or a five-day schedule or even a two-day or a one-day schedule is a lot of content for one person to consume. And if you take a class and then you don't use the things that you learned, you're going to forget it. Now, this is the reality of any kind of training that you're going to go through. It has nothing to do with SANS or SANS competitors or, you know, even other fields of study. The fact is that as humans, if we learn something and then we don't apply it, we're going to forget it. Now, this is backed up in science, and I'm going to show you this graph here, okay? I have two graphs. This is number one. Uh, Herman Ebenhaus, who was a philosopher back in 1885, he did some studies, and what he realized was that when you learn something, 24 hours later, if you've not looked at that again, you will forget 50 to 80% of what you learn. 50 to 80% of what you learned is lost in 24 hours. By day 30, you only retain about 2% of what you learned, way down here. This is the forgetting curve, and it's depressing AF. And by AF, I mean as fudge, you know, when you want fudge because it's so delicious, but you shouldn't eat it because it's just empty calories and sugar, but you want it anyway, so you eat it, and then you feel guilty afterwards, you know, AF. This is the reality of learning, where if you're not using what you learned, you're going to forget those skills. Now, Herman Ebenhaus also came up with a concept called spaced repetition theory. What he discovered is that within 24 hours, if you review the material again for 30 minutes, that will boost your retention right back up to 100% again. 48, 48 hours later, if you review again for 25 minutes, so a shorter review interval, your recall goes back up to 100% again. Each subsequent review requires less time than the, current, than the last review. And that is the secret to building long-term retention. Review, 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 but do it smart, not cram, not... I have to look at this every single moment, every single spare second, waiting in the elevator, pumping gas at the gas station, whatever it is, opening my phone, look at what I'm doing.
but to do that in a smart fashion where ideally right before you forget it, you review it again. That's the best way to develop long-term retention and the best way to optimize your time so that you can learn new techniques and remember them, not just Google something and forget it 15 minutes later. Now, if this sounds familiar to you, there's a reason for that. And it's because it's the, you know, elementary and uh, high school and middle school study program that many of us have experienced our entire lives. Tell me if this sounds familiar. Uh, good morning, class. Good morning. Uh, today we're going to read chapter four, and we're going to continue our study on early Republican Rome. We'll continue to examine imperial Rome with the introduction of the first Roman emperor, Augustus. Now, if that sounds familiar to you, it's because you probably had that same lecture in elementary school or middle school when you were a kid because this is what teachers have learned. Spaced repetition is not a new concept. It's being used by educators all over the world. But when we have conventional classes that go for nine months at a time or even three months at a time for a semester or a trimester basis, you have a much longer period of exposure and you can review what you learned yesterday before going on to the next material. That is the application of spaced repetition and unfortunately, when we take a class that's six days, it's just not something that we have time for. So if it's important for you to remember the things that you're learning when you're studying, when you're Googling something, when you're watching a webcast like this, it's also up to you to develop those techniques to build that as long-term recall. Now, what I did when I started learning about long-term recall and, and studying this is, I learned about this concept, and it's based off of two non-intuitive ideas. The first concept is this. A longer recall interval leads to stronger recall skills, not studying more frequently and reviewing the same material over and over and over again, but spacing out that study period. Now, you might still study every day, but you would study different material every day, not the same material every day. A longer interval builds stronger recall skills. And that seemed non intuitive to me, or at least different from what I've done my entire life and my own personal career. The second interesting concept is this the review intervals need to be short enough to recall the concepts, but you are ideally shooting for a minimal amount of review time, not longer and longer and longer review sessions, but just enough time to recall the material and then move on. So I started thinking, you know, who are some people that study technical concepts and have to apply all the time or have to constantly learn new things and are just always adding to new things It's as if their minds have no limit in the amount of things they could learn. And I came up with a couple of ideas. I started reaching out to med students, some friends that are doctors or even some younger folks that are in med school right now. I started reaching out to people who are polyglots people that just speak multiple languages and love the study and, the, and learning new languages. I also spoke to applied math majors because I figure they have a lot of things to learn and, and I don't understand any of the stuff that they do. And I heard a message consistently over and over and over again. The best way to optimize your study time is by using Anki. Now, Anki is a free flashcard application that integrates spaced repetition training concepts. Now, you might be thinking, this is all about a flashcard application. It is, but it has special capabilities. When you answer a question in this flashcard application, you reach your own ability to recall that information. And that's the key thing that allows the Anki algorithms to implement spaced repetition theory. When you have a question, like on the example on the slide right here, this question says, after disassembling the executable, add the following two lines to the beginning of the ASM source. And so this is something uh, with the tool um, disassemble.rb to be able to do uh, uh, ghost writing, to be able to do malware evasion. And I could never remember what those two lines are that you put at the top of your assembly language code so that you can recompile it back into a native exe file again. But the two lines here are dot section and dot entry point. And so this question would come up. And in my mind, I would say, okay, those two lines are dot section, rw, uh, dot text, rwx, 
and dot entry point. And look, even now with my eyes closed, I forgot it. So what I would say was, I got it mostly right, and I would say I did pretty good on that. If I really didn't know it, then I would say, show me this a question again. I, I just reviewed it, but you know, show me this again. Or if I really knew it, I would say, this is easy. With Anki, you judge and rate yourself. And those are also keyboard shortcuts, one, two, or three. So it's really easy to quickly go through Anki and, and to be able to look at all these flashcard questions and to see what's actually going on. Applying this technique allows Anki to show you questions that are optimized for space repetition theory so that it's only showing you questions that you didn't study yesterday or you didn't study the day before if you knew the answer. It's going to show you the questions more frequently if you kind of know the answer, and it's going to show them a lot more frequently if you're like, I, I had no idea, but test me again, and I'll build my retention on this particular topic. By using Anki in this fashion, you can take these concepts and turn them into your own long-term recall mechanism, optimizing your study time to grow and learn and to expand your technical vocabulary of things that you know and things that you're applying. Now, let's, talk a look, uh, let's take a look at using Anki and the, the majority of this presentation that Jason's gonna share on the Discord channel here is about setting up uh, Anki and, and how we use it for different techniques and, and how we can use it for studying and some different examples like that, okay? And so I'm going to come back to that. And instead of doing that slide by slide, I'm just going to show you this here, okay? Great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to start Anki on my system here. And normally I would launch Anki from my dock or from your start menu if you're using Windows. But I'm going to start from the command line here because I'm specifying start Anki in another directory as if it's a completely new install because I want you to see what it's looked like. Normally I would not start Anki this way. I would just go down here to the dock and I'll show you what my Anki deck looks like once I'm done here. So when you first start Anki, it's just gonna ask you what's your language. It's got a lot of language support, which is fantastic, okay? Are you sure? Yes. Okay. And then it's very unassuming. You get this, this kind of plain window here that doesn't look very exciting. but uh, I encourage you to spend a little time with this, and I'm going to show you what I have done to optimize my use of Anki and what's really working well for me. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new deck. So I'm going to create a deck here, and I'm going to call this deck Linux Command Line Kung Fu. All right? So this is a deck that I would use for the kind of things that I'm Googling that, you know, I, I forget on, on a regular basis, like, you know, uh, a command that, that I used to know but I can't remember anymore or something I found on Stack Overflow or whatever the concept is. And so I'm going to create a deck. I'm going to click on the deck, and I don't have any cards right now, so I'm going to add a card. Now, these next steps I'm going to show you are a one-time configuration thing. But I found that if I tweak Anki a little bit, it helps with my recall, makes my studying more interesting, and it makes my study cards a little more valuable for me to, to build and, and to use, okay? Now, before I do my first card, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this type here. Now, there's a basic flashcard, and I would encourage you to change this to the close type. The close type flashcard is the ones that I'm showing you here in the class where you are asked a question, and then it doesn't show you the answer, it just shows you the ellipsis there. And then when you press space, it shows you the answer of the question and the supporting information behind that. So that's called a close question. So I'm gonna change my type here to a close question and say choose. And now I could type my question in here, but I'm gonna tweak this a little bit to make this a little more rich visually for me. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to tools and then manage note types up here. And then I'm going to choose the close note type, and then I'm going to click fields. Now, remember, this is a one-time operation. You only have to do this once. The close field only has a text block, but I can add and customize these cards. And I'm going to create a new field called visual. Okay? And it'll ask me, hey, you know, this will be synchronized. And great, yes, thank you. And then that's fine. So now every close card will have two fields. I don't have to fill both in. 
The text one I do have to fill in, but the visual one I don't, but it'll create an opportunity for me that I'll show you in a second. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to go to this cards link here. And this is the format of the card here. And so this is the front of the card where it shows you this is a ellipsis closed deletion. Closed deletion is just removing something that you want to be tested on for your own study. And then sample in this case is the word. But what I want to do is I want to add another field. So in the back of the template here, I'm going to go in and I'm going to say open curly bracket, open curly bracket, visual, or whatever you call that added field, and then close curly bracket, close curly bracket. And then I'm going to close this here. Now, again, that's all a one-time operation, but look what I've got going on here. Now I've got my text, and I have a spot for a visual aid as well. Now I'm going to move this over to the side, and I'm going to do my Google thing here. And, uh, you know, when I started using Anki, this was important to me because I realized that I was forgetting these things I was Googling. And so in the slides and the example I used, you know, how to suppress new line, in awk okay and of course google the modern oracle tells me it's the first link here the featured snippet and it says here's the answer okay print will answer a new line by default you don't want that to happen hence use print f instead of course i don't if i don't want a new line i just say print f and then I can format the output of the print from the aux statement instead of print automatically doing a new line for me. Okay, awesome. All right. So now I would turn this into an Anki card. And so in my text block, I would say to suppress a new line in aux, use, and then I'm going to say printf instead of print. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight this section. This is the close block that I want to create here. So I'm going to press Command Shift C on my Mac, or I think Control Shift C on Windows. And notice how it puts it in this curly bracket, curly bracket C1. You can actually have multiple close blocks, even in a single question, if you want to. And then you can have each one of them answered one at a time, or have all of them answered at the same time. This is the order that the close blocks will be answered in. The other thing, though, and the, realize, the reason I put this visual element here is because it's useful to have some visual supporting element for that question and that answer. And this is really easy on my Mac. I can just press Command Shift 4 to be able to take a screenshot. I'm going to give a code ring here, the attribution. And I'm going to take and drag and drop this into Anki. Now, that might be a little bit different on, on Windows. You might have to save it as a file, but you can drag and drop that content right into Anki, and now you have that visual aid here as well. If you wanted to have that link here, you could have that link. You could have another field that would be just for a URL. It's totally up to you how you want to customize the front and the back of your Anki cards. All right. So now I would go through, oh, no, I don't want to close. I want to add this card. That happens to me a lot, and now I want to close. All right. Now, what you would do is build your Anki cards, and then on a regular basis, devote some time to studying and learning the things that you're trying to remember or trying to commit to long-term recall. I only have one Anki card in here, but let's show it to you, and then I'll show you what my real Anki deck looks like and what I'm doing. So I could go back to decks to choose different decks if I had them, but I'm going to stay in this one deck and I'm going to say study now. And then this is the experience of using Anki. To suppress a new line in off, use, I know this one, print F instead of print so I can format the output and suppress a new line. Great. And now I can say show answer, but I can also just press the space bar to be able to get this answer. And you can see how it tells you the shortcut key there. Great. And then it says, yeah. Here's the answer, use printf instead of print. And then here is my screenshot that I added as well. And that, that content can be HTML formatted. Um, sometimes I do little JavaScript or CSS to be able to format code blocks and things like that. But now I can use this as a mechanism to study with. Now, this is the important part of Anki. Before you even see the next question, you have to say down here, how good was your recall? 
Easy, right? Easy. And that's just by pressing number three on your keyboard. If you felt like, I kind of knew it, but I had to struggle. It took me more than, I don't know, 10 seconds to pull that out of my memory. I would say, good. If you really didn't know it, then I would say, no, I need that again. And Anki will use that to apply spaced repetition to help optimize your study time. And that really gives you a huge leg up on optimizing your ability to turn the things that you want to learn into valuable content and useful information. Now, I'm going to say easy here, and that's done for me because I only have one card for my study session. But I'm going to exit Anki and then open my real Anki deck and, and the one that I keep open and, and what I use as I go through my day. And so, you know, I, I have some different Anki cards in here. A lot of this I've already studied, so it's telling me that there's none that I need to study right now. But I can click on a deck here and I can say study, okay? And it will start asking me these questions. Minor classifies reconnaissance analysis using the pre-attack matrix. Pre-attack matrix, perfect. Okay, so now I'm going to say easy. I knew that one, okay? An attacker might start blank that forwards all traffic through the C2 link. So an attacker might start a, a, a port forward, a pivot, a redirector, a VPN. Could be lots of things, okay? So I'm going to say show answer. A proxy server, okay, all right. And now notice how these are different time intervals here, okay? Now, these are different time intervals because I've already answered these questions before. And Anki is adapting how frequently I need to see these questions again. Remember, the ideal opportunity for space repetition is to study for shorter study times where you are re-quizzed on that topic right before you forget it. And because I've answered this question several times before, it's saying, all right, you know this answer, Josh. I don't need to show you it again for 3.9 months if you say easy. Say easy. Okay. Anki is a flashcard app that integrates space repetition training. Perfect. Okay. Now, this is the kind of thing that we would do, and we would use this as a mechanism to try to recall the topics that we want to remember to try to turn that into something that we're going to be recall at the top of our head as opposed to just trying to guess or just trying to Google it every time we can't remember something. So let's talk about putting this into practice, okay? How do we practically use Anki? Well, I can tell you that on a regular basis, every morning when I wake up, I spend a little bit of time with Anki and I just quickly review a bunch of things. And then I will leave Anki running all day long. It's like Chrome and Anki don't get closed all day. They just constantly run. And as I'm going through my day, as I'm learning things, as I'm testing things, as I'm finding new vulnerabilities that maybe I didn't know about before or new opportunities for pen tests or red team engagements or whatever I'm working on, I just add those concepts to Anki. And I keep adding and I keep building and building. Now, Anki is available on Mac and on Windows, but it's also available on iOS and Android as well. So you can even use this on a mobile device to integrate your study time. By keeping Anki running, I'm much more likely to go from Google cutting and pasting something into Anki only takes half a minute or so. And now I will have that to quiz myself on later and to really turn those concepts into something I'm going to remember. Now, before we continue, though, I want to talk about two significant problems that Anki does not solve for you. One is the problem of motivation, right? Learning technical topics uh, requires time. It requires patience, okay? And you need to be persistent. You need to be self-motivated, okay? Now, what I did was when I was doing this study and, and I was trying to find out how are people learning these things and remembering them, I actually joined a bunch of Facebook groups. It's amazing, you know, there's so many Facebook groups that are just all trolls, but there's some Facebook groups where there's this amazing community of people that just want to share information. So I shared some Facebook groups for different pre-med students talking about how they're studying and what they're doing. I joined a Facebook group for polyglots, people that speak multiple languages, and I started asking questions. I would kind of just just sit and, and watch and, you know, kind of be 
quiet and, and see some posts for a while. But as you start seeing people that post more often, I would write questions and I would say, you know, how do you stay motivated at this? What, what do you do? And, and here's what I learned. Time and time again, people that are constantly learning new languages or med students that have to learn a complex subject and then build on it and then build on it and then build on it over and over again, what I heard was this. You need to have four things to keep yourself motivated. You need to find enjoyment. Okay? Remember earlier when I talked about why do you want to learn technical information? You need to find your enjoyment. For me, 99.9% .9 of my day is fail training. As a pen tester, I fail constantly. It's just failure after failure after failure. The best part, though, is that 0.1% of success and the amazing endorphin rush of getting that shell, of bypassing that control, of getting access where I should not have access. That's my enjoyment, and I, and I know that, and I, and I will never have enough of that in my entire life. I love that feeling. Now, that's not for everybody. Some people might be on the defense side. Maybe you want to do uh, technical writing. Maybe you want to do management. You want to study cases. You want to know how best to manage the team because your team can accomplish more than you can by yourself. That's wonderful, but you need to find your enjoyment. You also need a method, something like Anki, where when it's time to review and it's time to commit things to long-term memory, you're not just flailing around like a crazy person trying to flip through papers and wasting time. You go to Anki and you maximize your time because everything you need to study is already in there. You also need a system or habit development. For me, it's been every morning, okay? I get up early every morning, my house is quiet, I brew my coffee, feed my dog, and then I start studying. And I'm just reviewing things. I'm also reading papers I wanna read, I'm also experimenting with different hacking tools that I haven't had time to work with yet, but I'm now adding that to Anki as well and then using that to build my long-term recall. The last thing is patience. You need to have patience with this because it's not easy and it requires work and it's effort and there will be frustration. I get frustrated all the time. It's just part of being a pen tester, part of doing security work, even as part of being a defender. People get in and it's very frustrating. Okay? Stupid Bill with a stupid password of Tor on his system, okay? It, there's frustration. And you need to turn that into energy. When I get frustrated, I just, just double down and say, nope, I'm going to do this and, and I'm going to make it happen. The other problem is the problem of time. I love doing these webcasts because, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I know very little about you. I, I see a little bit on, on Discord, which is great, okay? I, you know, I don't, I don't know what your, what your sex is, what your gender identity is, what your skin color is. None of that matters. We all have the same problem, though, and that is that we all have competing factors for our time. Everybody, okay? Nobody has so much time on their hands where they think that, you know, I, I, I'm, I just have plenty of time to do anything I want. Even when you're retired, that doesn't happen, okay? There are all demands on our time, and our time is precious, and I understand that. And so what I'm telling you is, if it's important for you to develop these skills, then it's important to make sure you're devoting that time. Now, studying Anki 20 to 30 minutes a day may seem burdensome on your time, but if you're studying for an exam and you're cramming for 10 days, then that is going to offer very little long-term recall. Or if you did it for a month, 20 to 30 minutes down to 10 minutes a day with Anki, because remember, ideally we wanna to get to less study time, not more study time, that is going to be a much more valuable investment of your time. We all know cramming will get you through the immediate problem, but not through long-term retention. Anki is a tool to be able to help you get there. You also have to revisit your goals. Are the things that you want to learn worth your time? Or should your time be best spent somewhere else? I can't answer that for you. You have to figure out the answer to that question. You also have to answer what, question, what changes can you make in your life, okay? Are you willing to watch one fewer Netflix or Hulu or YouTube video, okay? Can you study over breakfast or maybe while exercising or, you know, can you talk to your employer? Maybe your employer, because of the economy being a little down right now, is going to say, hey, you know, we don't have a lot of money for bonuses or for raises. 
well, you know, I appreciate that the economy is down, but how about we talk about other ways I could be compensated, like allowing me to devote two hours a week, four hours a week, an hour a week, whatever you think a fair ask is, to professional development, and then use that time at work for study as well. These are all opportunities that we can apply you need to find that time somewhere. The answer is not going to be the same for everybody. And heck, I bet you knew all these things already. But if it's important to you, you're, you're going to need to find time to be able to apply it. Here's the thing that I want to end with here. I think it's such a great opportunity for me to be able to talk to you guys, to talk about one of my favorite subjects. I love information security. I love the field. I love the people. I, I love, you know, Jason and Velda and Bibi and John and these guys are, have been so supportive of me in, in my career, and it's been great getting to work with all these guys, and hopefully I'll get to work with you know, all the people on this webcast and all these people on the Discord channel, because I think what we do is important. Your job matters. It really does. Now, a, a friend of mine called me because she's the head of a school, and she got an email, and it said, you know, I'd like to apply for a position. My resume is attached. She clicked on the resume, and it was a crypto locker malware and it encrypted every single file on her computer. On her computer was every single photo of her entire tenure as the head of the school for 30 years, and it was all wiped out. And she called me beside herself, and she said, what, what can I do? And I said, you have two options. You pay the ransom, or you lose your file. Now, you might say she should have had a backup. She had a backup. It was attached. And so this is a big problem. And so she decided not to pay the ransom. And all of those photos of all those kids that she worked with over all her entire tenure of the school are, are gone. And it breaks my heart. And it's just one story. And I'm sure everybody on here has a similar story of somebody that's been kept, hit by crypto locker or identity theft or fraudulent credit card use or, or something like that. And it's up to us to work to stop that. Consider the alternatives. If you don't do security, what happens? Maybe important digital assets are lost. I'm a photographer, and it just breaks my heart that nobody prints anymore, because if your files are lost in a fire, crypto locker, whatever the circumstance may be, would you have those pictures of your kids growing up anymore? Those things are, are heartbreaking, and I would hate for anybody to ever experience that, okay? Ultimately, organized crime wins if we fail, okay? People lose their savings. They lose their retirement. I, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that cities could go dark and, and people's lives could be threatened. We're all in this together. Please support each other. Okay? Maya Angelou is one of my favorite poets. She was an amazing writer, actor, singer, poet laureate. And my favorite quote from her is, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. Use the things that we're learning. Do the best you can with what you know. And then when you know better, it's up to you to do better. Guys, as part of this webcast, I'm giving away a free exercise. This is an exercise that we use in one of my SANS classes. And SANS said, yeah, you can share that with the, with the world. And I went, great, because I want you to learn Anki. And so you can go to the link in the top of the slide here, and you're going to get a PDF, no registration, nothing like that. And then you can just download this PDF and just apply it on your own. You can use Windows or Mac or whatever you want, but it'll walk you through an example of how to do the things that we're talking about and how to optimize your study time with Anki. Okay? Feel free to contact me, josh at willhackforsushi.com, at Josh Wright, like on my little video thing here. And I would love to hear about your success stories, your struggles. You know, I, I don't think any of us live in a vacuum. And I think my problems are probably your problems and, and vice versa. And if you share those things, then maybe we can figure out a way to solve that together. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason for Q&A. Hey, everybody. Thanks for being here. All right. Welcome back. Yes. So Goofy Admin just said yes. Uh, Josh is an amazing presenter, and I agree. Uh, so thank you for sharing today. So we, one of the things I like about the, the Hacking Cast is they tend to be on the not necessarily 50 minutes. And so we have more time for Q&A. So imagine you have 20 minutes now to talk to Josh about anything that you want related to either the content that we talked about or uh, Josh has an amazing breadth of knowledge. So 
feel free to ask questions. So I'll take a look, see what we got. Any pointers for studying multiple subject at the same time? Yeah, so for multiple subjects and using Anki, you could definitely break up into different card decks. Uh, and that would be a great way to just kind of optimize the things that you're looking at here. And so, you know, in my decks here, you can even have groups of different card decks. So I'm working on um, creating all card decks for my 504 class here. And so, you know, I, I, I want to give that to all of my students so that when they leave, they can continue learning and continue retaining this information. As, as an educator, the worst thing is somebody leaves and forgets everything you taught them. So, you know, I'm trying to enable all my students by giving them these resources as well. And if you're studying multiple subjects, then I would, you know, try to build different decks for different subjects, try to organize them into whatever you think you might want to focus on. Like I might want to focus on endpoint security bypass, or I could see all questions related to the SIC 504 class, and, and that's an opportunity there. I often find it, and so, you know, I have done, so in my photography work, I study lots of great works, and I'm starting to build Aki decks just on a, on a different computer to recognize work by different artists, because I'm, I'm trying to get better at that. I, I know a lot of photographers' names, classic photographers, things like that, but, you know, sometimes you see trends in the work, and I'm trying to get better at that. For me, that's actually a different computer system because that time is allocated differently for me. My technical study time, I have you know, a, a much a greater devotion of time to. So this is my work computer that I'm presenting on. This is my Anki deck for work things, for class things, stuff like that. For different subjects, I might even use a different computer or just have something on my iPad or something like that. And, and for me, because they're separate study times and I have different goals and, and different motivation for studying the different topics, I, I, I even like to split out into different assets. Okay, so we got a bunch of questions coming in. So I'm let's see. First question that I saw, and I like, I like this one. What are the main difficulties you found when starting to use Anki? So the, the main difficulties in starting is Anki. So the deck that I just showed you a second ago is probably try number three for me, where I spent a bunch of time creating basic flashcards, and I didn't, I didn't like them. It wasn't the right experience for me. And then I discovered closed decks, and that is perfect. Like, that's, that's really what I want to use for study. Another problem I had was a lot of my early cards had no visual element, and I found that I just... But when I was studying, I was just staring at a wall of text all day long. And so I, I didn't want that either. And so I started adding those visual elements as well. So if you look at the lab exercise that I have here, that will help you get started and correct some of my earlier mistakes. Another thing that was a mistake early on was I would not have Anki running all day long. I would start it and then I would go to a deck and... and it was less convenient if it wasn't running for me to, in the middle of solving a problem, put the problem into Anki. I would be less likely to add the answer of the thing that I just solved to Anki than just move on. And so that was a mistake as well, but I find that keeping Anki running all day long, little things like I'll learn a little PowerShell trick or you know, a, a Python 3 thing that I didn't know before or, or something like that, and then, uh, you know, when Anki's open, I'll be like, oh, I'm going to add this to Anki. And then they just quickly kind of add it. And then I'm still going to forget it. But when I review it with Anki, it brings it back into my memory. And then after doing that a couple of times, now, you know, my Anki decks are like, you know, you'll see this again in three months and four months and six months because I've said, you know, yes, I know this. And now it, it will prompt me for the things that I don't know and, and optimize that study test. This one just came in from Brian. Would you recommend this approach for more hands-on practical courses like OSCP? It does have a gigantic PDF with loads of information. However, it's very hands-on. And I guess the repetition and hands-on element is what helps drive recall. Yeah, so uh, I think this works for hands-on techniques or just questions that you have. However you can describe the subject is great. So. One example in, in 504, the, the class that, that I've been working on, 
we, we are going through an update where now the class is 40% hands-on. And so it's just, it's, just a, it's just a ton of hands-on time in the class. And so what I'm doing with some of the student Anki cards is I'm taking command output and I'm, I'm just formatting it as fixed width, you know, courier new with a little gray background in Anki. And you could just do very simple HTML tags. So what I did was I have some CSS that says if it's in a pre-block, then you format it like I would expect a terminal to look. And then I'm using that to ask questions about analyzing that information and assessing what's actually going on. It's less memorize these command line arguments because I don't, I don't find any value in that. I, I don't do that at all. But it's more about situations like when you're encountering this problem or you want to target this system that's listening on port 445, but you can't reach it, how can you use Interpreter port forward or route or cobalt strike or netcat or any tool that you want to use to pivot from one entity to the other. So if you can describe it, then you can put it in Anki and then use it as a mechanism to help you study and analyze that. Have you considered scripting or automating the creation of the cards? I have not done that yet. However, it has crossed my mind. So <laughs> Anki stores its data in a SQLite database. And the first time I saw that, I was like, yeah, this is great. I can use this. And so I've done a lot of output scripting from it, but not adding things to Anki yet. I think it is possible. So for the SANS Institute, you know, we use PowerPoint for a lot of the stuff that we write. And I have a lot of experience parsing PowerPoint files in Python. PowerPoint in any Office document is really just XML documents behind the scenes. So I did start looking at the concepts of taking information, building Anki cards, and then using Closebox programmatically to be able to say, oh, this seems like a keyword, this seems like a keyword, things like that. The, where that fell down for me was when you build your Anki cards, you're building them based off of your understanding of material. And honestly, you know, people leave a class or leave a concept with different understanding. They may both have the same answer, but your level of understanding might be different, okay? So for example, if you don't know networking, and I say use the route command and specify a subnet mask of 255.255.255.255, that is an answer, right? You know, so you might know, oh, I put 255 here, but your understanding might not indicate to you that that means it's a 32-bit subnet mask and, and what that actually means for the individual host. So I kind of abandoned the thought process of automating the creation of Anki cards because, frankly, it's not about kind of massively taking a big set of data and then putting it into a database. It's more about taking your level of understanding of the information and making sure that you don't forget that. Is it easy to correct an Anki card? If you find that you've added incorrect information or if you're using one of the shared decks online and find errors? And that would be yeah, terrible so, if you want to build an Anki deck full of terrible information. Yeah, so is it easy to edit an Anki deck? You can always yeah. export an Anki deck in a couple of different formats here, okay? So, you know, there's there's way to do that. So if you wanted to do that, you could edit there. But there is also this browse feature in Anki where now you can have all of your decks and you can change any of these keywords here or, or you know, filter anything you want. So like this is an Anki deck that I made for module endpoint security bypass in the 504 class. And so if I noticed a mistake in here, then I would go and then just, you know, correct it, typo or something like that. So mm -hmm. you could do it kind of one off here or if it was really bad, and you wanted to do some kind of said magic, you could export to a text file, use said or any other programmatic tool to fix it, and then just re-import it into Anki. Uh, this question's come up a few times because I think you have some 504 uh, alumni that are watching right now. And they want to know, is the 504 deck, Anki deck that you're building for the current students available for past students? Uh, I'm going to make it available for everybody. So the the dilemma is my time and how much time I have to spend on making that. So 
I'm not committing to a date yet, but when I feel like that Anki deck is in a good place, I'll post it on Twitter. And then my Twitter feed is, is up here beneath my name. So, you know, you just took that and, and you can grab it from there. But honestly, I'm, I'm creating the Anki deck because when I started learning about the forgetting curve, it was appalling to me. And, and the thought that so many students go through the class and then maybe they don't remember the things that they learned because they just didn't have time to apply it or didn't study or, or something like that. I don't, I don't want that. I don't want that for, for anybody. So yeah. for me, this isn't, this isn't something that, you know, I'm going to charge somebody for. I just want, you know, this to be a resource so that people can apply the things they've learned and then turn it into real value. So thanks for that. Can you share and describe your Python method for parsing PP slides, PowerPoint slides? Sure. So So this is a project that I wrote that's on GitHub called PPTX Index. And what PPTX Index does is it takes, so what this does is it generates an index document in Microsoft Word or Markdown format or both. And it uses what's called a concordance. And a concordance is something that an indexer will build to be able to say, these are the important concepts that I want out of my class. And so, in this project, your concordance can be just a string, right? So find out every time the word iTunes or you know, Apple Configurator or, or any of these things are in the PowerPoint files and then identify what page number that's on and then use that as your index. But it also has this other syntax where you can say, this is the term in the index and then use this Pythonic expression to match a page where this term exists. And so it can be any Pythonic expression. So here, pen test in page or pen space test in page or penetration test in page and book number equals two or book number equals three. Whatever you want to do to specify that. So that, that's the concordance and that takes some time. So I build concordances for all my classes so you can get the indexes. And then the PPTX index code here what this does is it uses a few different tools. There is a Python package called docx and pptx. The problem with the pptx package is that it doesn't parse notes. It only parses slides. So what I did here in this code was I have a XML parsing code, which is pretty hideous, but it, um, it takes and identifies using the XML within a PowerPoint file what those endpoint nodes are and then it parses them. And so here's a function that parses the slide contents just for the slides themselves. And it takes that PPTX file, unzips it, gets the XML files and parses all that with some custom things for fans like classes. And then I have, you know, a, a same function here, but just getting all of the paragraph text using the XML tags from the Microsoft Word documents. And then it uses the concordance file, builds this big dictionary of page number and all the text from that page, and then uses the concordance Pythonic expressions to find out, does this page match the indexed entry by a simple string or by the Pythonic expression that I've created here? And then the rest of it is things like, <laughs> this is awful and I hope I never have to edit this code. Okay, so that's a classic me comment right there. And so, you know, th that just makes page ranges. Oh, it's in pages one to 10 as opposed to one and two and three kind of things. And it just, and it just goes through and, and parses all that, that, that data. You know, I, I generate a markdown because I'm a markdown fiend from that. And it's not that long. It's like, I don't know, three, 400 lines of code. Yeah, it's 266 lines of code, but it's, but it's not a bad example. Uh, another probably, Another project is something I wrote called PPTX URLs. This is very similar, but is a little less complicated. And what it does is it takes every URL from a PowerPoint document and it just checks to make sure that the URL is still that valid. No 404s, no redirects, you know, no 500 errors, things like that. 
but you know, this is just some sample code to solve problems that I had. And so, but this is all on my GitHub page. Can you post that in Discord? Yes. And um, with our final question, I have one. Yes, sir. I have one for you. You're one of the most prolific people I know for creating, developing, putting out tools, writing books. What, it, what makes you, you, and how can other people do that? So what's the thing that, what's your secret sauce? It's funny because I've been told that before. And, you know, my, my good friend Jeff said to me the other day that he has always admired and wondered how I'm able to be so productive and get so much done. And it's funny because I don't, I don't feel that I am. And maybe that's the secret. I always feel like I did not accomplish enough today. And, and it's a hard way to live because it's, it's, it's depressing AF as mm -hmm. much, right? But, you know, maybe the secret is to, to never be satisfied with what you do. So my work day, I start, I wake up at 5 a.m. I brush my teeth, I make coffee, I feed my dog, and I'm working by 5.10. And I do that every day. And, you know, on, on the weekends, I'm doing things with family, things like that. But, you know, I, I stop. I generally stop working around 5, 5.30. So my work week is generally at least 60 to 70 to 80 hours. And I only sleep around four hours a night. Now that, it seems extreme when I say it that way, but I've been doing it for so long that, you know, it's just, it's just how I go. Jason and I were talking about the bags under our eyes before, before we started class, right? Before we started the session. Uh -huh. I, I don't know. I, I feel like I am never satisfied with the amount of work that I've done, and, and maybe that's the key to it. I am always looking for opportunities to become better, to accomplish more, to, to do more, and, and that's kind of my motivating energy. Plus, you know, I, I don't really need to sleep that much. I'm sorry, I, mean, I, wish, I wish I had something yeah. that was a better piece of advice, but that's, that's how it goes. So I had the exact opposite conversation with someone today. And it was the, uh, I, I kept a post-it note on my laptop for a long time that said, how much is enough to feel like you, you're enough today? And it was just a constant like, gut check for me. It's like, all right, time to shut down for today because you just get to a point where you're like, it's not enough, it's not enough, it's not enough. And so it's yeah. Yeah. And it's And it's hard, right? There's, the, you know, I probably need to speak to a therapist about my, you know, lack of being satisfied with my own work. But I, I think it's important. And it, that's not to say that I don't spend time with my family. Yeah. You know, I work from home and we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner together every single day. You know, we, we, mm -hmm. I, I cook every meal. I try to find time for photography and, and the things that I want to do. But it's, but it's all about that balance, right? And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I feel like I'm constantly striving to figure out what that balance is. Yeah. I know there's so many in the community have benefited from your prolificness. Even like my wife, she was working on something and she was using like she was using your tool that you created, for, you know, for wireless hacking and stuff. And she's like, Hey, tell Josh, I said, thanks. Like, cause yeah. Yeah, there's so many people out there that have used what you've built and built on top of that. So thank you for the work contributions you've made, Josh. Well, thank you, J Jason and I, just for everybody here, we're talking about maybe a future session about the, the techniques to we use what other people have done in a way that's fair, but that also promotes your own career. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe, maybe that'll be a future thing that we'll do too. Yeah. All right, everybody. Josh, any final words? Just thank you everybody for being here. Thank you for the opportunity, Wild West Hack and Fest. And, you know, I just want to get this word out because it, it helped me and I hope it helps you as well. Please reach out or I'm on Discord now. I'm going to try to catch up on chat messages, but thank you everybody for being here. Awesome.
Thank you all for tuning in today for this Wildwest Hacking Cast uh, with Josh Wright. The recording should be up soon. If you're watching the recording, then how meta is that? So we'll see you all next time. Bye.